8 a.m. Let's get after it. Thursday morning. Last chapter. Woohoo! Don't know about you guys, but that's slightly exciting from my perspective. Like, yeah. There's a certain momentum I'm not liking right now. <laughs> so let's get after it. We are aware to that should go. Let's go here. Now let's rename this. Let's go desktop. Fantastic. Everybody see what I see? A snow maybe, chapter 17 and its real value. Okay. Sorry about that. Not at double digits yet, so I'm just going to sort of like pretend we're doing something useful. Let me draw some shit out for you. Let's go like this. One, two, three, two. Let's go like this. Let's go like this. Let's go like this. Chinese water drop torture. Let's go here, definitely there. Cool. No, we at almost at double digits. At double digits. Fantastic. So let's get to work for real. So um, as other people start to trickle in, what I want people to do is notice what I'm going to be doing here. Over the course of the next two days, I'm gonna start interspersing materials we haven't thought about in quite some time, um, going back all the way to chapter one and thinking about how we can overlay that on side chapter 17, where 17, of course, is our study, or at least our introduction to what are the special senses and what you can see here, of course, is I have one encapsulated in this set of brackets here, all of our somatosensory and somatomotor output pathways. And two down here, I've broken up for you um, the sort of basic schematic of how you should be thinking about the parasympathetic nervous system. And, you know, if you were here when I first started drawing these things, it took me about two minutes and sort of like every once in a while, it I'll have a meeting with a student. Like, you know, at the beginning of a test, all I do is vomit everything out onto a sheet of paper and try to remember everything that way. And I think if you can learn how to do this and learn how to create this inside your mind's eye and then use it while you're thinking about chapter 17, that is your best review for chapters 12 through 17. Okay. Um, and that's not me just saying that. That is sort of like if you went to, let's imagine you uh, went to the USMLE um, medical licensure exams for physicians, right? You know, when you look at the questions that are asked of you, you have to have these types of schematics inside your mind so you can answer the questions of, well, what drug works where sort of thing. Okay, so getting in the habit of learning how to create things like this for yourself is really an important task. Um, it's really an important skill set just simply to have. Don't think of it as a task because then you won't do it. But Getting rid of my uh, sort of sleepy Thursday morning voice. Found some BBC program last night and I watched one too many episodes of it. So um, I'm tired, that's all there is to it. Um, let's see. So what does your body do and why is chapter 17 so important to you? Uh, well, it has to meet the needs of each cell to stay alive, okay? And so far we remember that if here's a brain and here is pituitary, pituitary gland, right? And here's the pons, and there's the medulla, and here's the spinal column. Yay. How does it actually get all that information to know which cell needs what? Okay, what it actually is doing, of course, is it's assaying what's inside the cerebral spinal fluid from any given moment, number one. Number two, it's collecting information from primarily your 12 cranial nerves. 
12 cranial nerves, CN, okay? And 12 paracranial nerves, I should say, okay? And then whatever pieces of information that might require some sort of change, say, say, series of appropriate receptors from our somatic sensory system, or maybe um, imagine we actually have the vagus nerve collecting sensory information and sending it back to the brain. So the vagus nerve now can tell, tell the brain that a larger volume of blood needs to be ejected sort of thing. So all of this actually has to come together. And that's what chapter 17 really helps us with because it all has to sort of make sense. If chapter 16 was integration for the somatic sensory and somatic motor relay systems, think of chapter 17 as that special set of inputs that are then allowing for integration here at the diencephalon so that the hypothalamus can check to see how things are going on inside of the body. And that's what I really, that's what I would think you'd like to take away from this. But remember, I said it's the 12 cranial nerves, and now we need to figure out what those 12 cranial nerves are actually doing. You learned where they were located. You learned where their cell nuclei were located or their ganglia were, no, were, were ugh, ugh, mixing words there, were located inside the body. But what I really hope you're going to be doing is by the end, the end of this entire semester, you sort of have this framework of where information acquisition has come from. Let's go back. In your final review sheet, chapter one, describe anatomical position, metabolism, and homeostasis. Well, Next week we'll be going over, you know, what does anatomical position mean? But when I introduce some of the structures today, notice what I'll be doing. I'll be saying these structures are bilateral. You will see that they are anterior surface facing structures that, you know, collect information from outside of the body using a series of exteroreceptors or photoreceptors. Think about how I'm describing where structures are found inside of the body. And Professor, of course, we can see that our body itself. Sorry about that, chair. Professor. Yeah. Can you hear? Me? Oh, okay. This yeah. is kind of a dumb question, but is lecture over next week, or is it just lab? It's pretty much lab, Ryan. But you'll see that I'm, you know, I'm putting together. You know, there there are already reviews out there for your final exam. You probably want to use those, but um, you're going to see that interspersed inside of lab, what I'm doing. Is I'm saying, oh, okay, this is the information, how it applies to number one and how it applies, I mean, say chap chapter one and how it applies okay. to your final exam. Does that help? Yeah, so there's no traditional 8 a.m. Zoom lecture. Oh, God, no. Monday. I'm, I'm going to be in lab with you. How the hell, how could I be in two places at once? Okay. I didn't know if it was, the, the lab was exactly at the same time, but it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Great question. I'm glad you asked. I'd hate to see you sort of stroll in at like noon and go, where is everybody? <laughs> we'd hate to see that thank you yeah no problem okay um now by this point in time we have seen so many examples of negative and positive feedback systems this semester primarily negative feedback systems we haven't really seen a positive feedback system until amp2 but essentially your entire nervous system is a positive feedback system <laughs> Cohen's not here to actually do that, but the reality is, is you should understand that you're, it's, it's essentially your entire nervous system is a positive feedback system. You should know the levels of structural organization from atomic definitions. Literally, when we think about chapter two, what is a proton, what is a neutron? How, when we assemble those, we have an atom. From an atom, we can then make molecules. From molecules, we can make compounds. Compounds, we can start to make materials to make cells. You know, think about those four basic um, macromolecules and we think about what a carbohydrate is versus say what a lipid is, okay? Notice from there we get to what an organism is. In lab on Monday, we will review, or for those of you who are in the Tuesday grouping, we will review the common regional names, directions, planes, stuff like that. And you should be able to practice using them for on your final exam. You know, if I say you need to find this organ, you need to be able to tell me where it would be, or if I cut the organ a specific way, which you'll be doing in lab, you want to be able to say, okay, that's a frontal cut, or this is an oblique cut, okay? And by the end of chapter one, everybody inside this class, by the time they finish the first lab next week, will be reminded of 
where each organ is found inside of a cavity, a quadrant, and a region. And that's the way I'd like you to learn it, okay? Learn the cavity first. Is that if it's the ventral cavity, is it the thoracic portion, is the abdominal portion, and is the pelvic portion, okay? And then if there's a quadrant, which quadrant is that material in? Please remember that the diaphragm separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. So now, how would we use this with, say, the special senses? Well, let's think about that. You know, where are your eyes? Your eyes are inside an orbital cavity, okay? Where's your ears? Where's your nose? Where's your tongue? So you describe the anatomy as you're going through this. That's what you want to practice doing, because those are the types of questions we'll be asking on your final. So let's compare general senses and special sen senses, okay? Somatic sensation, those tactile thermal pain and proprioceptive pathways that you've spent probably yesterday looking at and going, how am I ever going to remember all of these? What is it? Six total pathways or something like that, right? They're scattered throughout the body and they're relatively simple structures. You have a specific type of dendrite or piscinian corpuscle or free nerve ending or something like that or modified structure. But when we think about special senses, they have unique cells that are built for the detection of a unique modality. What is smell? Smell is the detection of different chemicals that are in the atmosphere okay, at a specific concentration. And as they pass over the olfactory receptors inside the olfactory epithelia, inside the nasal cavity, that's where detection will occur. Taste, you're gonna see we have a series of what we call buds and those buds are on your tongue and your tongue will have different populations of buds, okay? Each of those will detect a different chemical. In this case, in liquid, your saliva. Vision, photons of light striking photoreceptors in the retina of your eye causing the inhibition of action potentials or graded potential or charge for that matter of a resting membrane potential um, on a cell. Hearing, the fact that you can actually hear me right now means that some form of energy is leaving either your speaker system or your headphones, vibrating the tympanic membrane, striking three different bones, incus, malleus, and stapes, causing fluid to move inside of your ear. And what's happening with that fluid is then moving hair cells, and those hair cells are now making sure that they're causing a depolarization, okay? And that depolarization is what's driving what you can hear right now. Equilibrium, one of the fancier ones, but it's the same idea. We use a series of little tiny stones, and those little tiny stones, collectively, we call them autoliths, okay? And those autoliths, depending upon where you are relative to gravity, are going to sit on a series of hairs, stereocilia, kinocilium. And what they're doing is, relative to where you are, the stones and the liquid then causes a series of depolarizations. Now you're not gonna remember any of that. In fact, most of you are like, where the fuck is my coffee at this point in time, right? Instead, what we wanna do is we want you to see special senses, unique cells located in specific areas in your cranium, okay? Anatomically distinct structures with complex neural pathways. If we think about, somatic senses earlier in the cartoon or the first cartoon I drew, there's a first order neuron that becomes a second order neuron that becomes a third order neuron, general. Here you may have that same idea, but unique cells detect um, a specific modality and now it travels on a repeated pattern. If we think about say the um, optic nerve, you're gonna see that there's something unique about the optic nerve you wanna pay attention to. And that is really quite simple. Your eye is split completely in half, okay? Or as you guys would say, half, okay? So, <laughs> sorry, I wanna see who's awake. Nobody is yet, okay? So the idea is that um, if this is actually happening, it means mother nature needs to take that information and then split it apart. So she can then reassemble it inside your central nervous system. So let's start with smell the oldest of all of your modalities that are available for you to detect the outside world, okay? 
olfactory epithelium and the olfactory neurons are the future, primarily the future of regenerative nervous system structures inside the body. Um, a group in China has made probably the most, the most advances in differentiating different nervous system structures out of olfactory epithelia and olfactory receptors. It's actually quite exciting, applying a different series of growth factors, changing the environment, you can get these neural cells to differentiate into other neural cells, which is amazing, okay? If you think about what that would mean to rebuild somebody's nervous system. Now, inside of those olfactory receptors, remember way back when inside chapter 12, I said, oh, look, inside our special senses, we're gonna see all of these bipolar neurons. And you're like, yeah, I don't care what's on the test. So look, what's gonna be on the goddamn test? Bipolar neurons are required to build the olfactory receptor, and they actually have ciliated structures, which gets us back to chapter three, and those ciliated structures create surface area, and they're called olfactory hairs. Okay? And they respond to chemical stimulation. Okay? And chemical stimulation is literally just that. It is anything. If uh, you know, I was making fun of New York the other morning, right? And I used to ride my bike down. Oh, what was it Second Avenue? Yeah, to get down to the med medical center, right? And you know, the only thing you smell on an August morning in New York City is the trash that's rotting in the road. Okay, so that chemical stimulation was that odorant of all of that material that's mixing on the ground on an August morning in New York City. Now we're not quite at August, but I guarantee that if you wanted to go down to New York, probably you wouldn't experience that as much right now. Fewer people moving around and all of that but the concentration of those odorants created the activation of those neurons. Okay. Cool, one second, let's do this. I know what happened to you, sorry about that kiddo. Sorry to make you weak. Okay, now what's gonna happen is they're going to be thinking about, let's see, how's this gonna work? We have to construct this so it's actually a functional system and you're going to have basal cells that can actually replace those olfactory receptors. And this is what I was speaking about a moment ago. The ability for you to, your, ner your, your, your nervous system to actually um, no longer become sensitive to something is uh, an experience. You know? So by the time I got off the bicycle, back of the medical center where the Rikers Island you know, truck shows up with all of the individuals who have to go to the hospital that, that morning. By the time you actually get on the elevator and get off the elevator on the 16th floor and somebody who was wearing way too much perfume, okay, by the time you get off the floor, not that I was wearing way too much perfume, but imagine if you will, on floor number one, that somebody steps into the elevator with you. By the time you get off the floor on the 16th floor or something like that, you know, the ability to actually detect that odor is gone, okay? Or you have a screaming headache, or that person no longer can smell the chemical that they're actually putting on their skin. Each of these things have something to do with what we're gonna call adaptation, and that adaptation is what actually changes. So what does it look like? Okay, here's a cartoon. Um, trying to think, you know, we do not do a sagittal view dissection on any of your organisms. So maybe we'll take somebody's rat and we'll try and do this. I don't know if we have um, a saw that's sharp enough to do it to give us a clean cut. But if we did, and this is a mid-sagittal view, notice here is the oral cavity, here is the nasal cavity, here's the external um, narynx right here. And what's going to happen is as you inhale, gases are pulled in, these concha and meatus create this area where turbinate action occurs to warm and moisten the air before it actually heads down to your lungs. But the byproduct is whatever's inside this air is now actually covered, covering these olfactory hairs with odorant molecules. And this is collected bundles of axons of olfactory receptors ascend. They activate now the olfactory nerve. Okay, so here's that olfactory bulb neuron, and this is what becomes the olfactory tract traveling back. And remember, 
when we're learning the cranial nerves, the olfactory nerve is the only one that does not travel to the thalamus. So you can't forget that. Just because we covered it inside chapter 14 doesn't mean you forget it now. This is the pathway. This is the stuff you absolutely positively need to know for not only your fourth exam, but say the final exam, where, look, if you can apply what you learned to say chapter 16, you can do it here for chapter 17 as well, where here's our olfactory receptor collecting as an olfactory nerve. Notice it does not go to the thalamus. Instead, it goes to the primary olfactory area of the cerebral cortex. Now, in this case, which side of the patient is it on? Do you have enough information to figure out which side of the patient it was on? If all we did was give you this image here, don't look at this one here, because this one tells you what it is, right? Amy, you oriented yet? Uh, <laughs> I'll take that as a question? no. Okay, no, I'll give you like five more mi minutes and then nobody no, else no, no, is don't, talking today. I missed so. the whole class. Ask a question. My brain will synapse. Okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes. Oh, I asked the whole, whole, whole class, but nobody's answering shit this morning. This is like a, this is like a silent walkout or something. Okay, but, but uh, <laughs> um, in a few minutes, I'll sort of walk you up. You know, we'll do a sort of like summative, summative sort of analysis of how to use chapter 17. Okay, okay, so what you're seeing here is a pathway that's being created. So for 17, if I teach you a pathway, you make sure you know it for your test. All right, number one, number two. Look at this. I give you the pathway. Woohoo! Odor and cells bind different receptors. Who remembers what type of receptor a G protein activated system would be? P substance. Okay, so yeah, so that is that is a neurotransmitter that would actually bind to it. That's correct or substance P is what, what, what you meant to say, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. I was like, do you need to go to the bathroom? I don't know what's going on. No. <laughs> okay, but no, so is this a metabotropic or uh, what, what other type of receptor could this be? This town. Wow. Is that from chapter 15? Chapter the 12. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to remember. Never mind. Exactly. Well, so here's a good thing to think about, right? So I gave you a hint. I said metabotropic. The other possibility would be ionotropic receptor. This is a metabotropic receptor because it utilizes multiple steps intracellularly to cause the opening of a channel, right? So this G protein causes the opening of sodium channels, which now allows for a generator potential such that that the, the bipolar neuron will now synapse such that you create this olfactory tract, which then travels to the primary olfactory area of the parietal cortex. Okay. So this is, so when I say, when you're thinking about, you know, there's this example of a pathway here, visually, this is really easy to see. No problem, right? How does it actually work? Well, it's a G protein activated system. So the actual odorant binding the olfactory hair causes a metabotropic receptor to be activated. That causes a generator potential. A generator potential causes the olfactory tract to send information now to that parietal cortex, ignoring the thalamus. Cool practice, whatever. Okay, taste. You're like, yay, taste. When we're thinking, Evelyn, are you awake? Yes, I am. <laughs> Were you hoping I wasn't going to call on you? No, I was hoping you would. <laughs> You're such a liar. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Evelyn, have you had, is it Evelyn or, e or Evelyn? 
We went over this last week. I know, and I don't remember. I'm old, remember? It's Evelyn. <laughs> wow, so touchy at 8.25 in the morning. My heavens, you must you be fun just, to work with. You just keep like, calling yes. me Ev. Ev is fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever. What did you have for breakfast, and what did it taste like? Um, I had a protein shake. It tasted like spinach and peanut butter. <laughs> Kick ass! Okay, so now, now everybody inside the class who's ever tasted spinach and tasted peanut butter, they're probably going, what the fuck, number one. But number two, they're going, oh, I know what peanut butter tastes like, and oh, I know what spinach ta tastes like. Did you add any sweeteners to this, Evelyn? Well, my protein is vanilla. So it was a little sweet. Okay, so so you're more of a stoic than you are. This is more for sort of like, you know, your well-being sort of thing. Yes, no, maybe? Yeah. She's like, yeah, I'm down with the stoicism thing. Fantastic. Great. Okay, so now what I want you to see is all of those independent flavors, Evelyn, okay, are going to activate all of these different populations of cells we call gustatory receptor cells. And like your nose, they have gustatory hairs that will detect the distinction between, let's say in your case, vanilla, spinach, and peanut butter. Were there any fruits you added to that or was that it? There was a banana. <gasps> oh my heavens! So there, is it like a ripe banana or is it like green banana? Um, it, it wasn't too ripe, but it, it was like kind of green yellow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so now why would I ask that question? Aside from being a jerk, you don't need to say that out, out loud. It would be sweeter if it was riper. Fantastic, right? And each of, so each of the concentrations of those materials would then activate different populations of cells that actually can bind each of those chemicals, right? So that's generally how it works. So what Mother Nature does is she decorates your tongue with these, pil these papilla. You actually have filiform, fungiform, and valet papilla. And the responsibility is for them to detect unique pieces of information. Now, we're not going to ask you on Evelyn's tongue on Thursday morning on, well, what, what is this, July 30th, 2020, those different types of flavors activated which papilla of her tongue. We don't need to know that. Instead, what you need to make sure you pay attention to is that they actually have about 50 gustatory cells per each taste bud, okay? And that valate may also be called circumvallate inside of your textbook. What we want to know is that the types of taste are sour, sweet, bitter, salty, and umami. And there wasn't any umami in your breakfast this morning. Do you understand that? I do. You do. Fantastic. Where was the bitter in your breakfast this morning? The spinach? Yes, awesome. So that actual iron taste is where the bitter came from, right? And the salty could have come from your peanut butter, okay? The sweet, obviously, from the banana and the, and the vanilla. Not so much in the way of sour, unless the spinach was actually rotting. And something tells me, Evelyn, that you don't use rotting spinach in your protein shakes in the morning. Is this correct? I don't know. It depends. <laughs> exactly. Like, how much money do I have and how much food do I need to eat? Yes, completely agree. Okay, so you know, the idea, or are you not awake and you're not paying attention to what you're putting inside the bullet when you're making your breakfast? It, sometimes I'm like, does this pass? Should I get new spinach? And I just kind of throw it all in there. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, right? A little tummy ache. <laughs> exactly. Maybe you're running to the bathroom a little while later, but you know, all's good. You got some nutrients out, out, out of it. And, and the papilla on your tongue were temporarily happy. Did you notice that? That when, even though, even if your shake came out, do you, what sort of protein powder do you put inside of there? Or do you put any at all? It's whey. Okay. So there's not much flavor with that at all. Would you agree? I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, so the sweetness or the saltiness of this mixture when it hit your tongue, what did your brain tell you? That it was yummy. Kick ass. Did you just think about that for a second? Your brain just went, oh, life is good. Okay. And what's <laughs> happening there, of course, is by even thinking about the food, there's actually this 
series of pre-digestive steps that activate the vagus nerve to release saliva so that the plasma membrane of the gustatory cells has sufficient water to dilute whatever it is you just ingested, okay? And that receptor potential is gonna cause cranial nerves. <gasps> in bold, look at that, I'm being nice to you. I don't know why I do that, it's the worst thing in the world to do for you. But take a look at the cranial nerves we're using here. What is seven, nine, and 10 for cranial nerves? Anybody but Evelyn, because Evelyn's been very, very patient and polite working with me this morning. Unless, of course, you know the answer, Evelyn. Nope. I know Amy, 10, you awake yet? Is Vegas. I know that. Kick ass. We got Ve Vegas. Whatever happens with Vegas, make sure you goddamn well know it. This has nothing to do with Las Ve Vegas. <laughs> Let me answer it for you. you guys. Joe. Somebody's mumbling something. Speak up, Sophia. I can't say it. Okay, don't worry it's about it then. Glasso. Glossopharyngeal. Awesome. Okay. That's number nine. What's seven? Facial. Kick ass, Stephanie. You're like, I'm so reticent to say anything at all, but I'm tired of listening to you talk, so I will answer. Okay. Kick ass. So why, why now? Why switch to chapter 12? Well, why does Mother Nature need three different cranial nerves to actually do this work? This is when we think about nervous tissue again. Remembering what's actually happening here. Remember, we need to figure out the difference between, say, a neuron and a neural glia. This gives us a chance to think about what's actually happening here. We've had enough of a series of EPSPs to remind you that those sequence of events need to actually create an action potential. So when we go back here and we think about what's going on, all of these different chemicals are activating some receptor potential. Notice how this was different from our previous example, which was a generator potential. What's going to happen is we activate these three cranial nerves in slightly different ways, but now we're traveling to the medulla, then to the thalamus, and now to the primary gustatory area. Did anybody see something new here? When have we ever gone to the medulla first? That's what I was wondering. Kick ass, Cohen. Okay, so far so good? Cool. And here's what it looks like. This is um, umami, because the only thing I'm thinking in my mind is like umami broth. But it's exactly kind of what, what it is, right? So, and it's, that's actually sort of a, if you think about Worcestershire sauce and um, what's that soup? And Mia's. Um, there's probably umami broth inside of that. And that's why it's, you know, that's why it actually has the unique flavor. But normally, if we, if we taught this class, you know, 20 years ago, umami wouldn't have been there, right? So it was, it was just sour, sweet, bitter, and salty. Now, umami is sort of this combination of the different amino acids that create this mixture of signaling. And that's what umami actually is. Has anybody ever, actually ever looked at a bottle of Worcestershire sauce to look at the, the components? Mm -hmm. Caleb, we know you drank that just so we can compare your breakfast drink with Evelyn's drink. Now yours has scotch in it, right? Yeah, that's right. Only different. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm more of a whiskey person at eight o'clock in the morning. And Evelyn's like, no, my name is Evelyn, damn it. Call me Ev, please. He's like, oh, sure. Okay, Ev. Okay. I got a we'll get it all I got a, I got a kombucha green tea right now. Okay, that's there awesome. What, what the hell is kombucha? You don't know about kombucha. Like, like, no, I mean, uh, I know about it, what is it? It's like uh, germ culture. It's like, what is it, like germ culture? Okay, it's but mushroom. what is it about? It's mushroom. I'm sorry? It's mushroom. Yeah, okay, but what, what, what do you do with it? Okay, let's go back to here. Mm -hmm. Sour, sweet, bitter, salty, right? Of that, it's actually a fermented structure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. All right, so that fermented structure actually creates what? Do you remember? from chapter 10? Anybody? 
in the absence of oxygen, glycolysis becomes fermentation. Alcohol. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, fermented, right? And that's what actually your kombucha is, and your kombucha then actually has a very high quotient of bitter, which is what actually activates your tongue, right? That's what you're actually tasting. And it's, you know, all these different kombuchas are those different mixtures of things that are allowed then to ferment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Green tea. So that's the, so, so you're, so you're actually having your antioxidants, a little bit of pH shift, and it makes you feel more awake, Ryan? Yeah, a little caffeine in there. Check out. So the take home message here from this cartoon though, as we're moving along, is notice that there are three cranial nerves here. And for, who's taking AMP2 with me? Anybody? Me. Oh, yes. Me. Oh, no, shit. Ev, you're taking it with me? Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Caleb's like, I'm so glad I'm not taking that class. I'm, I'm so I'm glad. I'm taking AMP2, but I'm taking it with a different professor because yours didn't fit my schedule. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know. Okay. <laughs> okay. But the idea is going to be this. On the very first day of class, I'm going to ask you, what are the three most important cranial nerves? And this is the answer you had better tell me. And you better be able to have a reason to tell me why. Okay. So the facial nerve, the glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve, they are the three most important cranial nerves. But if you think about what we're doing now with just, say, gustation versus what we saw inside chapter 14, you get a much more complete answer for what these cranial nerves can actually do. Your brain, the moment materials hit your tongue, sweet, sour, salty, umami, what, whatever, your brain takes an immediate inventory of what it thinks you are ingesting, okay? And then prepares for that, okay? So your stomach then is like, oh, I think we're getting lots of this. Oh, I think we're getting lots of that. Now, it tends to have more of a general response to it. And it's well beyond our pay grade today to think about that. But all this information is traveling to the medulla and then to the thalamus. Okay, for it, the processing that would happen after that. And that's actually how we tie in our autonomic nervous system. Now, I drew the autonomic nervous system for you earlier, right? There's our, we have one long preganglionic neuron, a short preganglionic neuron. We have a short preganglionic neuron and a longer postganglionic neuron. In today's cartoon, remember, I drew in the adrenal gland. It's been a while since I drew in the adrenal gland for you guys. I needed to remind you that in some instances, the sympathetic nervous system will release epinephrine and norepinephrine at a far greater concentration than we would normally see. So when we're reviewing chapter 15 for the final, which we will be doing for the next two weeks, you're going to differentiate between the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And what does it mean if we pref preferentially activate the sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Remember, at the end of the day, you can't walk out of, you can, I hope you don't walk out of this class, meaning the entire course, without understanding that your autonomic nervous system is an antagonistic nervous system. For every single signal that the parasympathetic nervous system tries to establish, the sympathetic nervous system can tell it no for a short period of time. And then we return back to normal. You should so be able no, to even, Yeah. There's no agonist component to the autonomic nervous system? Um, the, the concept of what dual innervation means is that at the level of effector, Amy, that is an antagonistic relationship. A activating the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous systems, say through a cranial nerve or something like that, that is the agonistic le level. Does that make sense? Does. I just am, I'm like in trying to organize my understanding of things, I pair, or I didn't pair, but I put agonist and antagonist together. You should. So, and thinking of if, and I'm trying, like, I'm pr trying to prepare myself for the types of questions that show up on the test. So, if I'm, if I see a, a question that deals with uh, an agonist, then, or uh, if 
no, let me rephrase that. If I see a question that deals with an antagonist, then do I know that it's not talking about the autonomic nervous system? No, no. you can't make it that simple. There's, it's not but, that simple. Okay. Yeah, but, but, what, but what you do have to do is realize that the only thing we've really taught you about how the autonomic nervous system works is when we're looking at how the effectors respond to a stimulus, right? And those effectors are shared. And that means in, let's see, it was blue for the sympathetic nervous system, right? So let's do this to make sure that everybody understands this. We'll have a synapse traveling here. We'll have a synapse traveling here. We'll have a synapse traveling here, right? And by dual innervation and therefore antagonistic, it means that there is going to be also a synapse traveling here, synapse traveling here, and a synapse traveling here. And that's what we mean when we say antagonistic, okay? At those cell membranes, there are either nicotinic or muscarinic receptors or alpha and beta receptors that are adrenergic that respond to either norepinephrine and epinephrine or acetylcholine. And that's where the antagonism actually occurs at the target tissue. Okay. Okay? Yes. Cool. Can you um, go over again, like, or the main points between the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like, how- I was confused when, like, when it gets to the pre and the post ganglionic neuron, like which one works with which? Okay, so thank you for asking. Um, let's do this. Inside your mind's eye, Sophia, it is Sophia, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so draw a ball and stick inside your mind's eye, okay? Okay. With me? Mm -hmm. Okay, and ball and stick, remember we're gonna break up the autonomic nervous system. And in blue, I'm gonna draw for you the sympathetic components, right? And I'm gonna make this overly sim simplified, so I'm gonna put, only put a few of these here, but this is the thoracolumnar portions that make up the sympathetic trunk ganglia chain that exits outside of the spinal cord, right? Okay. And then what's gonna happen is these are gonna travel out to different locations, okay? And we're gonna create a series of ganglia outside here. And then from here, they become little dotted lines. Doink, 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 okay? Just to make sure everybody sees it. This is an oversimplification. I'm not trying to draw the whole system, right? Number one. Number two, if these are the, the sympathetic routes to target a specific tissue, it means that in red, these are our parasympathetic routes that are used to innervate those same tissues such that I've drawn this cartoon down here. So that every single one of those targets inside of your body, either glands, cardiac muscle tissue, or smooth muscle tissue is duly innervated. Does that help so far? Yeah. Okay. okay, cool. Now the next part is both sympathetic and parasympathetic pieces. I'm gonna switch over to no colors here, okay? Both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Let's go like that. Let's go like this. Let's go like this. And let's go like this. Have both a preganglionic neuron. and a postganglionic neuron. So I'll put pre here. And I'll put post here. And I'll put a bracket to separate them from each other, right? So there's our parasympathetic, here's our sympathetic. And if we had all the time in the world, I'd have you explain to me why one is which sort of thing. I should have made this longer, I should have made that one shorter. But the same targets would be, here are our glands, right? Here's our cardiac muscle tissue, and here's our smooth muscle tissue, right? Okay, so each of these now has 
this, and this is the part where I think you have some confu confusion, but correct me if I'm wrong. So each part, the parasympathetic para and sympathetic, each part has a preganglionic neuron. Each part has a postganglionic neuron. But going up here to our original car cartoon, the preganglionic neuron for our sympathetic nervous system begins at the lateral gray horns of the thoracolumnar portion, thorolumbar, okay, portion of our spinal cord. Our parasympathetic portion begins with four cranial nerves, and that's why it's called the cranial portion, and our sacral portion it has those pelvic splanchic nerves here. And that's literally how you want to begin separating the two of them. Did that help? Or did yeah, I just overwhelm it? So, no, no, that makes so much more sense. So the, diff, the real difference is um, basically where it starts. Fantastic. Okay. okay. And now, so to begin, you need to know where each of these systems is beginning, right? And mm -hmm. then what you need to remember is that if this is our parasympathetic here, to activate our target tissues, the neurotransmitter we use here is acetylcholine. Or and it, it could be the non-epirin or the epirin if it's for the sympathetic. Very good. And that's what I was just about. I was going to bracket these guys together. And I was going to put an arrow outside of here and go epinephrine. So E or nor epinephrine here, nor E. Okay. With me? Yeah. Fantastic. If you can keep that together and then apply that sort of color coding I did up here, you can answer any test question we're going to ask. Because now, once you get that down, all you need to do is go back and lay in, okay, what type of receptors do I find where? Okay. okay. If you're... And then I had a question about the receptors. Sure. Um, so when it was talking about... Um... I was trying to figure out basically where the motor end plate at the neuromuscular junction was, but it was related to the nicotine and the muscarinic receptors. Okay, so, so yeah, so you're confusing pieces of information there. So our neuromuscular junction, if we think about what we taught you inside chapter 10, that is our lower motor neuron of our somatic nervous system, okay? And it's releasing acetylcholine. However, inside chapter 15, they do go on to say that, say, cardiac muscle cells and smooth muscle cells, they will have a neuromuscular junction. It's not described the same way we do it, but at that location, it could have either a nicotinic or a muscarinic receptor within the autonomic nervous system, not the somatic nervous system. The somatic motor nervous system will only have one type at skeletal muscle tissue. We'll never have both, okay? okay. So only in the autonomic, it will have Very good. Both. Okay. okay, and okay. generally speaking, nicotinic is excitatory, and muscarinic is inhibitory. Inhibitory. Okay. Cool. Fantastic. Great question. Thank you for asking. Okay. So now how does this actually help us with chapter 17? Okay. So we're approaching one hour. We're at the what? Third special sentence. So, so how do you actually see? And you see because there's visible wave. So if you have the electromagnetic spectrum, that's what you actually see here. This is all of the potential energy that we can detect in our known universe using the technology that we have, right? So gamma rays all the way through to radio waves. And this small sliver of information right here, this is visible light, meaning the wavelengths of energy that your photoreceptors inside of your eyes can detect, okay? This actually means that this is the highest amount of en energy, meaning the frequency is the highest amount of energy versus the lowest amount of energy being read. And what actually happens is these wavelengths of energy have literally energy inside of them, and it's transmitted by the fact that there is 
little tiny particles we call photons inside of that space. And what they do, of course, is they pass into your eye and we regulate that. So we have a series of accessory structures that are the outside of the eye. Okay, so this is definitely important for lab for not this coming week, but the week following that. But we can introduce it now where you have things like eyelashes, eyebrows, you actually have the palpebrae, which is your upper eyelid, the lower eyelid of the palpebra here. Okay, and what you can actually see is you have that lacrimal structure, you actually have a medial commissure here, and fluid is released from here to cover all of the cells of your eye. Okay. These are avascular structures and your tears literally bring everything that your eyes, the external portions of your eyes need to function. Okay. If anything, if anybody, anything ever touches your eyelashes, what happens immediately? They immediately slam shut, right? The eyebrows are designed to keep materials from falling into your eyes. Okay. I always think, I always think about that one, you know, about clubbing. Uh, 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 uh. And you watch people have like shaved their eyebrows off and they painted them in. And I'm thinking, I wonder what sort of shit falls into their eyes. <laughs> and like, do they know they actually needed those eye eyebrows? There's gonna be a spider that's gonna crawl into their eyes when they least expect it. And they'll like hit the eyelid and they'll flip out in the middle of the night. Uh, right? No, never. Anyway, shit that goes through my mind when I'm out clubbing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In like hot pink leotard going, woo <laughs> There you go. <laughs> the things you never want to imagine. Anyway, fantastic. How does the eye actually work? Well, here are some of the muscles you're going to actually have to learn inside lab. What happens, of course, is we decorate the eye at six major points to either have the eyes move from side to side or up and down. So superior, inferior medial and lateral, and by creating two other points, you can now cause some oblique motion on. So you have external extrinsic muscles that move the eye, and then you have internal muscles that change the shape of the lens, that changes the light that strikes the retina of your eye, okay? Likewise, your, levitate, your levitator palpebrae muscles actually open and close your eyes. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> who here can wink well? Is there anybody inside the class who can wink well? I mean, like on command, like you see somebody and you're just like, eh, right? No. How did you learn how to do that, man? Because I cannot train my levitator palpebrae. I mean, I've been on this planet for like thousands of years, right? And I still can't wink. Not that I want to wink at anybody inside class. Don't get me wrong. But I want you to think about this for a second. Your eyes can slam shut and open rapidly with, without any conscious control. But at some point in time in your life, you said to yourself, I need to learn how to wink, right? And, and that meant you spent hours in front of a mirror probably, probably hours you wish you had studying anatomy and physiology instead of thinking about how do I get my left eye to go, tink, right? In just the magical way, okay? Because what's actually happening there is you are then causing effector muscles to open and close, number one. But number two, the rate at which they're opening and closing actually catches the other person's, get this, eye. <laughs> you get that? Cool. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> what is the purpose of actually having a lacrimal apparatus? <laughs> Sophia's like, <laughs> I paid extra for this class. <laughs> she's, she, she's, she's, she actually had shut off her computer so she could practice blinking, but now, <laughs> no, okay. she's like, huh? no. So tears. No. Um, I, I tried um, when I was younger, it never works. I gave same up. here, man. I'm like, eh, <laughs> right? But now, <laughs> the point, of course, is to get you guys to laugh so much that you actually cry. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Yeah, I haven't gotten you there yet. But the idea, of course, is if you're crying, it means that your brain thinks, what the hell is going on here? You're keeping your eyes open for too long, and you literally form tears. The lacrimal glands actually are excretory structures. So they're exocytosing some materials into a fluid, and that is now traveling out. Forget about nasolacrimal ducts. You'll never be tested on that shit. I just need to make sure you understand that tears actually have a purpose. They actually have antibacterial materials on, on them. 
they actually are rich in glucose and salts, and that actually covers the exterior portion of your eye. Now the anatomy, internal anatomy of the eyeball, as we're approaching nine o'clock, right? And we're getting close to where I wanna to stop today. Okay, we're, what you're actually looking at here is you've taken a transverse plane through the eye where there's a superior view. So we're literally looking down on the top of the eye if we've cut your head open from the top, okay? What you're seeing here is there's a lacrimal sac on the medial portion here, traveling to the lateral portion over here. This would be the outside of your skull over there. And what we've done is we have opened up the anterior cavity of your eye that's covered okay, by this structure that's called a cornea. And these are epithelial and connective tissue cells that are translucent. Light is allowed to pass through them. There's a series of fluids that occupy both the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. Everything inside of your eye is actually a fluid-filled sac, okay? And in this space that light is passing through, the aperture, the amount of light that's actually allowed into your eye is regulated by this thing that's called the pupil. And the pupil's diameter, how it opens and how it closes, of course, is determined by the amount of light, what you're actually trying to see, all that sort of stuff, right? Autonomic regulation of that series of muscles, okay, determine how much information, how much light gets in there, right? And what that means is, depending upon what you're looking at, if it's something that's really close or something really far away, a series of suspensory ligaments will change the shape of your lens, okay? So this means you actually have ciliary muscles that pull on those lig ligaments that change the lens shape. And when they change the lens shape, it changes how and which portions of light energy actually strike the retina back here. And that retina, okay, you're gonna see here in yellow, functions in an unexpected way. So what's gonna happen is, okay, who wants to, actually, I don't care if you wanna do the experiment. Close your eyes, take one of your fingers, place it on one of your eyes and try and push in and tell me what you feel. Your eye, like the eye started moving. Yeah, the eye started moving. What, what, what sort of level of pain did you experience? Not a lot, I wasn't pressing it hard. Okay, press hard. Don't. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, don't press hard. You need to be able to see. Anyway, okay, so, so the idea is this, right, is the actual shape of your eye is determined by the amount of fluid that's actually inside of your eye. And do you guys remember back in chapter four when we secreted proteoglycans? No. That's, that feels like years ago. Doesn't it? I was just going to ask, how long ago does that actually feel? It should feel like, like three, uh, year, three years ago. Exactly, right? There's, there's, there's some sort of time warping that's going on on here. But the major proteoglycan inside of the eye is called hyaluronic acid. And that hyaluronic acid is a proteoglycan, and it binds water to create the shape of your eye. Okay? And you might notice... Who went out drinking last night? Amy. I was doing my job. What, out drinking? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Liar. Cranky. Anyway. <laughs> if you stay, well, okay, never mind. I, yeah, you okay. guys already I'm, know way too much about my personal life. I, I don't want to know anything about your personal life. Question, no, stay away ask from the it. Question, okay, stay away from mine. I stay away question. from yours. Okay, but the I, idea is this. Is, Okay, who went out drinking last night? I thought to myself, who's the most likely person to go out drinking? Amy. Anyway, she's like, that's not true. How that's dare you? Me. It was Evelyn who went out drinking last night. And that's it was Caleb. Was Let's be serious. Okay. <laughs> no. Excuse no, I, I, I literally haven't drank since this class started. I know. There's My no social life is gone. Yeah, yeah same. Oh gosh, you're all being so I... <laughs> good. My heart's melting in my chest. Okay, but that person, I just want to make sure, did somebody ask me to be serious because they need me to be serious or did they think I was being too frivolous? I'm just asking. For no, questions. no, no, I was trying to make fun of Caleb. 
Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> okay, cool. Because yeah, I know there, there comes a point in time when I'm trying to get you to learn something, but if you think I'm being too frivolous, pause for a moment. Ask why I'm asking you to think that. Okay, I'm asking you if you went out drinking last night, do you realize you probably dehydrated your body? And when you woke up in the morning, the world was actually kind of blurry. The world is kind of blurry because that extra fluid that you had inside of your body is now missing from inside of your eyes. And the moment you actually have those two really large glasses of water, maybe an aspirin and a Tylenol, okay, what you're taking care of, of course, is the inflammation that's happening inside your eyes and inside your brain. But now you have sufficient water volume inside your body to now return the shape of the eyeball to what it's supposed to be. All those things you've done to your eyes over the years, you never even knew, right? You're like thinking about, what was it? What sort of whisk, what was brown rum or something like that? What the hell was that, that rum you guys Party. were drinking? Party dark. There you go, fantastic. Something I would probably never put in my body at all, ever. Just <laughs> Professor, that. you are the person who brought up Bacardi dark. <laughs> I did not bring up Bacardi Dark. Not at all. I know oh, somebody else we're going threw up back after to the they tapes. ate some sort of chicken meal with it. Right? We're going back <laughs> to the tapes. Please don't. <laughs> I am. I am def. I am definitely not a, a rum person. Not that you need to know that. Okay. Okay. You guys. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. How How would eye drops work? So Can eye drops have a couple of different things inside of them. One of which is. Uh, the irritation, the pain that you feel on your eye is from vasodilation of blood vessels, right? So what they do is they act as a vasoconstrictor and they push the fluid out of that space. Okay, that would be one mechanism. There are different types of eye drops, right? There are some people who have inflamed eyes constantly and that's a bacterial state. So they have some that have antibacterial cytos and side of it and stuff like that. Does that help? Yeah, kind of. Just because, like, I know eye drops are, like, saline solution. So I know, like, if an eyeball, like, was to rupture, you could put saline solution to, like, inflate the eyeball back. Or that's, like, whatever. So I was just wondering if, like, if that had any anything to do with um, so, the fluid on the inside. Yeah, okay. So, Catherine, can I ask why you're asking? Okay. But, I was just interested. Yeah. Okay. So that, so how many of you use this in like, like grade school when you get stoned before grade school, like third grade, fourth grade, you're sitting out in the schoolyard <laughs> exactly, and, and, and you've already figured out that if you steal mom and dad's eye drops and you put them inside your eyes, nobody knows you're stoned inside class. Yes. No, maybe Did nobody ever do that in third grade or fourth grade. No, no. Not third or fourth. <laughs> that's a little, that's a little early on in <laughs> development. <laughs> okay well please don't do that anyway the point is this is usually when somebody asks me a question like like that you know why do you actually use them in that case eye drops you're right most of it is a saline solution and that saline solution getting back to chapter three that is an isotonic solution of 0.9 percent and remember i said that the lacrimal glands are what are supplying the tissues at the exterior surface of your eyes and by applying that liquid that area feels normal for a short period of time and that's why the vasoconstriction or I mean that vasodilation goes away okay okay thank you sure no no problem all those things you never wanted to do in third grade now you're thinking about okay cool <laughs> like third grade i mean shit i was barely making it to school <laughs> That's okay, so was I, so was I. <laughs> okay, okay so, so how do we actually build an eyeball? Catherine, is that a question or are you just laughing? No, no, it was just a question. <laughs> exactly, okay, cool, Okay, three layers, okay, so we have an outer layer, which is gonna be a sclera, and this is dense irregular connective tissue. This is literally the white of your eye, okay? Now that cornea is actually translucent so there's something about the construction of the cornea that is different we don't worry about that inside this class but obviously that's the only way this could work you actually have a vascular tunic or uvea okay and that's the middle layer okay and that middle layer is what we would also call the choroid and you'll see choroid a lot in amp2 and what choroid actually means is rich vasculature okay so the tunic the vascular tunic actually has many, many blood vessels inside of that space. 
and it uses diffusion to feed the fibrous tunic as well as the retina. Okay. So the vascular tunic feeds both the fibrous tunic and the retina itself. Number three, that retina itself actually has specific areas inside of it. I don't really care about optic disc or macula lutea, okay, which is the fovea centralis, the highest point of clear vision inside of your eye. Who the fuck cares? Okay, what you need to know is actually how this thing works, okay? Accommodation of vision. So what actually happens here, of course, is images that you're looking at are actually turned upside down and backwards. Well, at least in this case, upside down. Okay, what's going to happen is the pieces of information are passed into the lens itself, and this takes the information and projects it, projects it upside down on the back of your eye. And where it's traveling to on the back of your eye, of course, is what we want to do is figure out which pieces are being excited. You have two populations of photoreceptors. They're called rods and cones. Cones are red, green, and blue detections of energy wavelengths. Rods are shades of gray. Okay? Spectrum of essentially pure white to a spectrum of essentially pure black. And what that means is that each segment of your eye is going to have different amounts of photopigments and photoreceptors to actually collect that information. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So here's two prototypic photoreceptors. Here's a rod, here's a cone. What happens is Mother Nature points the outer segment away from light. You're like, what? Yes, the photoreceptors, if light is coming in through, let's imagine you, your eye is here and light passes in, it passes and strikes that outer segment. What happens is the photoreceptor units are found inside of here. And what happens is then that information is then passed along the inner segment to regulate synaptic vesicle release onto guess what type of cell? A bipolar cell. Woohoo! Now, how this actually works, we take a bit of a detour here. Yep. And that bit of a detour takes us to how do photopigments work? Okay, there are four types three in the cone and one in the rod. What they do, of course, is they actually use a specific opsin or retinol to actually absorb light and then change the biochemistry inside of the cell. Okay, <clears throat> normally I have students do a little experiment uh, inside class. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to find a bright light inside of your room. I want you to close your eyes before you actually look at it. I want you to open your eyes, count to three, looking at the light, and now close your eyes, and I'll begin to ask you some questions. Okay, cool. You can open up your eyes and turn back to your computer now. Okay, so when you opened your eyes and you looked at the light, you saw a really bright light. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. As you looked at it, you'll notice that the edges began to move sort of shimmered, if you will. Number three, when you closed your eyes, did you notice you saw the reverse image? When you closed your eyes, what happened is you saw the brightest parts were in fact the darkest parts, and the darkest parts were the brightest parts. What actually is happening here, and if, you didn't, if that didn't happen to you, your light isn't bright enough, okay? okay? What's happening here is by putting together cis, so here's opsin, and here's ret, so here's our pro proteins, here's our photopigment. We're putting together this rhodopsin molecule inside of one of those outer segment structures. Light will hit this, and what it does is it isomerizes, it changes the shape of the retinol, and that becomes transretinol. So here's our opsin, here's our transretinol, and what happens is the longer you were staring at that light, I said three seconds because I didn't want you to go blind and pay attention for the rest of, lose your ability to pay attention for the rest of class, that transretinol structure, okay, is what we're calling photobleaching. You're literally bleaching the ability for more light to be collected onto those photoreceptors. And what happens is it releases that transretinol, and now the opsin, 
is going to use an isomerase to convert that transretinol back to cisretinol. And this is what's required for you to continually be able to see for any period of time. Now, maybe that light experiment didn't work for you there. However, maybe you're driving out at night and I'm gonna pick on a car only because I think they're probably the greatest defenders of this at night. You're driving down the highway and there's an Audi passing in the opposite direction with you, from you. And no matter what you do, they're on their low beams, presumably, that Audi is blinding you, right? So the moment the Audi passes your car, what can't you see? Anything. I hate that shit when people do that. And, and they're not even not using their high, high beams, right? What's hap happening there is the, the type of light that they're using now is so effective that it literally blinds you as you pass outside of that visual range. Now, the thing to do, of course, is immediately blink as many times as you can. But you're like, no, I can't blink. I'm driving and I can't see anything. Well, you can't see anything already. The process of actually blinking accelerates the retinal isomerase. And that's what actually helps reset your ability to see. Now, I want somebody to do another experiment with me. You can't do it now. Tonight, when you least think about this class, I want you to go outside and I want you to close your eyes, look into the darkest part of your yard or your neighborhood or wherever you are inside of your room. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to sit there for a count to 10. And then I want you to open your eyes. And then I want you to realize you can actually see in the dark. And what's happening there, of course, is by closing your eyes for that period of time, what you're doing is you're activating the potentiated cisretinol population. So any light scattering inside of that environment now allows you to actually see what you wouldn't be able to see 10 seconds before that. Okay, so if you're ever running through the woods because there's a big raccoon chasing after you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Remember to pause long enough to be able to see because believe me, the raccoon can see inside the dark. You can't, okay? So far, so good. So the take home message here is we have an opsin, we have a ret retinol. This is part of our rhodopsin molecule. By light striking it, you isomerize that retinol so it becomes trans retinol, and the retinol isomerase is what converts it back. And this is actually how you make sure your photoreceptors do not become light saturated. So, what does this actually have to do with anything? Well, I've already spoken about the hypo, isotonic, and hypertonic. And thanks to Catherine's question, we got to remember that isotonic solutions are 0.9% sodium chloride inside of your body. What we're looking at here is multiple cells using different types of membranes. And if we go back here, remember, here's our rod disk inside the outer segment. We populate it with a series of integral membrane proteins that actually have this isomerase activity that can now return things back to normal. How did we make those proteins, folks? Remember, there's a gene for each of those proteins, so that gene has to be transcribed, translated. Remember, we have to pull the intron sequences out, so we actually end up with an mRNA. We travel to the small subunit of a ribosome. We attach our methionine. We add our, we add our large subunit. We then bring in tRNAs that bind the codons. You get where I'm going with this? Cool. Now, because each cell needs to be replaced at some point in time, you do, oh, how do we say this? Visual acuity is a diminishing resource over the course of your life. So if I've been alive for like thousands of years, the fact that I can actually see at this point in time is a small miracle in and of itself, right? But what's happening for most of the events inside of your body, definitely to a lesser extent inside your nervous system. If you think about the fact that if you look at what aging actually means, you lose visual acuity, you lose hearing acuity, you lose your ability to taste. I remember um, this one patient once where a uh, sort of horrible sort of request, but it's not, it's not uncommon. I was working on a sort of like, rehabilitation sort of end terminal life care project at the time. And um, the patient asked me to 
you know, help them no longer be with us, right? And um, I said, well, you know, I can't do that, but, but maybe you can help me understand why you want that. And she said, she said, over the course of her life, the real joy she got out of life was actually being able to taste her food, okay? And she could no longer taste her food, okay? And at that point in time, of course, if that was her only real joy and that real joy had now been removed, well, then what was the point of actually living? And I can't tell you how the story ends, but um, more than anything else, what that left with me, of course, is that Mother Nature, if you think back to your tongue and that sort of the display of those different papilla and actually how it is you create foods and remember, and it's working with the smell at the same time, bringing together these different cells and they no longer have the ability to replicate and replace themselves, that does mean that each cell ultimately will have a terminal sort of description. Okay, okay so we already spoke about that. I already spoke about that. We're gonna finish off here. This is where we'll pick up tomorrow. How do these photoreceptors actually work? Because this is some funky physiology. It's not gonna work out the way you think it's gonna work out. So light. Light strikes something and it's going to cause, look at this, a cyclic GMP gated sodium channel. You're like, what the buck? <laughs> I'm barely getting down to, hey, I got ligand gated, man. <laughs> I know now that sodium is going to go in. We have a cyclic GMP sodium channel that's going to op open. And notice what it does. This is going to cause an inflow when your eyes are closed. So every time you blink, this is what actually happens. Cyclic GMP gated channel will open. Membrane potential now travels to minus 30 millivolts. That minus 30 millivolts, notice we have no minus 55 here or anything like that, but a minus 30 millivolts. We're gonna release glutamate. And glutamate is going to take a look at this. Earlier we thought of glutamate as an excitatory molecule. Now you think of glutamate as an inhibitory molecule on <gasps> in red. Bipolar cells. Come on, Jonathan. Bipolar cells. Yay. Fantastic. When your eyes actually open, notice what happens. You actually, that isomerization, isomerization of retinol activates the enzyme that actually breaks down cyclic GMP. Now you close that channel. Inflow of sodium no longer occurs. You hyperpolarize the receptor membrane potential. Glutamate turns off and you release less glutamate and therefore natural excitation of bipolar cells occurs. Okay. That's a pretty good place to leave you guys because that's completely opposite to anything we have ever taught you before. Okay, you're like, why can't this stuff just get easier? Well, it does, because we can use it to review the other stuff you better damn well, well know. Okay, do I have any questions? How's everybody doing out, out there? Can you put this PowerPoint online, please? Try, yeah. I think all the others are already up, up there. I mean, they're yeah, already up on uh, YouTube, so yeah. No, the PowerPoint that you're showing right now, can you? You put that up? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. If that's all. Have a wonderful day, folks. See you guys tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Au revoir. <laughs>